And hey everyone, welcome back to our ongoing discussions in ethnic politics. This week is, well, it's going to be a doozy. It's going to be a big one. It's actually a two-part lecture that uh, I've decided to just combine uh, into one really long discussion. But I promise it'll be good, and I promise I will do my best to entertain you. Um, we're looking at the political culture of contemporary American conservatism. And I uh, preface that with the word an overview because we could run an entire class. We, you know, entire books, studies have been written about this phenomenon. And probably the most disconcertingly ingenious thing about contemporary American conservatism, especially cultural conservatism, is that the more you think about it, the more absurd it seems. The more illogical, the more contradictory, uh, the more it's just based on, like, you know, surrealistic hyperbole. And yet, here's the big thing. Cultural conservatism of this kind in, in the United States is not only powerful, but it's gaining adherence. I mean, it's, you know, it has effectively taken over as the voice of the Republican Party. And it's something that even, you know, the Democrats have been really unable to figure out what to do with for at least the last 30 years or so. Um, it's been ridiculed. It's been derided, um, you know, all kinds of journalists, editorialists, talking heads, so-called intellectuals have kind of scratched their heads wondering why so many Americans, especially white Americans in, you know, so-called flyover states, not only believe these narratives, but take them as non-negotiable truths, right? Take them as absolute fundamental beliefs in, if not how the country works, how the country should work. And so this head scratching, this, uh, you know, sense of incredulity among, you know, for lack of a better word, um, you know, coastal liberal elites asking, you know, something like, well, what's the matter with these people? You know, what's the matter with Kansas? Is really the topic of this conversation. And Thomas Frank's book, which was uh, published um, in 2004 and 2005, hardcover and then um, you know paperback with a with a new afterward, um, really forms the the foundation of this discussion. Um, this is the work that uh, was assigned to this class for uh, the next two weeks here, and you know the question, what's the matter with Kansas, has been sort of euphemistically you know, for a number of red states that vote really against their economic interests. I mean, this is really the big issue is that Kansas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Missouri, North, South Dakota, you know, a good chunk of middle America, they all vote in lockstep with the Republican Party. I mean, almost to the point where uh, the Democratic Party, especially during uh, the presidential campaign season, doesn't even bother uh, setting foot in these areas, right? They just kind of fly from East Coast to West Coast. Why is it that these communities basically support a political party that openly and unapologetically advocates for economic policies that directly hurt them, hurt their businesses, roll back um, social safety nets, deregulate a number of environmental protections and employment safety acts, and continue to push the argument that health care is somehow antithetical to being American. Right? So it's not so much that Kansas is somehow culturally disconnected with logic, but that the people that vote for the Republican Party are doing so, you know, apparently knowing that this party advocates things that directly hurt them. So what explains the need and the reason for voting Republican, right? So this is, you know, our accompanying text, which is going to provide us with um, a couple of main points that will serve as our two-week discussion. The first is what are the underpinning myths of modern American political and cultural conservatism, right? So in order to understand why groups vote the way that they do, we really need to look at the um, you know, the elements, the core narratives of what cultural conservatism is and how it is sold to these, um, you know, wide audiences. 
Um, and then we can finally ask, right? You know, why then do so many Americans vote against their socioeconomic interests? And as part of that question, how has the Republican Party, right, a political party that has openly and unapologetically advocated for you know, predatory capitalism, um, promotes plutocracy, and um, you know, vocally um, calls for the elimination of the welfare state. How has this party managed to capture the hearts and minds of the white working class? Right? I mean, you know, when you think about this, um, an electorate that should vote against everything the Republican Party stands for. So if the issue lies not in the economic, but in the cultural, then I think it is important, vitally important, that we understand this narrative and the language that the conservative right uses. And within Frank's book, the collective narrative of cultural conservatism is known as the Great Backlash Narrative. It's one that I think ingeniously started around the early 1990s and has kind of taken on a life of its own over the last 30 or so years, to the point of um, almost you know, turning the entire Republican Party into one of the most authoritarian right-wing parties of any you know, um, you know, electoral democracy in the world. So what is this great backlash, and how does it shape the collective memory and group identity of ordinary Americans? And how is this great backlash narrative, an extension of earlier models of populism, and how has this new type of what we'll call national populism created, um, though built on existing concepts, of an us-them divide, right? Because if the great backlash is a way of juxtaposing um, conservatives from liberals, heartland versus coast, um, traditional versus, you know, intellectual and modern, this us-them dichotomy, which is something that we've talked about pretty much since day one in this class, um, fits rather nicely in differentiating us, but more so from them. And finally, I guess if, there, if we could answer this question, um, what really is the matter with Kansas? Um, and, you know, to that, is there anything really the matter at all? Or does the fault lie not with the Republicans, but with the Democratic Party and modern American liberalism, which almost seems to subconsciously create its own stereotypes for the great backlash narrative to work against? I mean, in a way, are there any grains of truth in these narratives, right? You know, oftentimes, we kind of get lost in the hyperbole. And, you know, the more and more that you think about, you know, some of these ridiculously so non-satirical, they have to be satirical ways of understanding American identity in the heartland, um, the more you got to think to yourself, you know, this can't possibly, can't possibly be taken seriously by anybody. And here's the, um, you know, inconvenient truth. Not only is it taken seriously, it represents a major mobilized political cultural element within this country, right? We like to sort of ridicule and denigrate what we'll call, you know, America, you know, um, you know, Budweiser drinking, NASCAR driving, watching, um, heartland dwelling, country music listening to, uh, you know, Bible thumping, uh, flyover states, right? We like to just kind of uh, consider them to be, you know, nothing more than innocuous curiosities. But here's the, here's the horrible truth. Murica is organized. Murica's got money. America is far more grassroots organized than any left-wing progressive movement wants you to believe in their podcasts. And America has been unrelentingly chipping away at many of what we would you know, previously regard as immutable truths within American political culture. And unfortunately today, you know, in 2021, you know, I've, I've come to realize over the past 30 or so years that reality is oftentimes dictated by the most insane person in the room. I mean, that, that began as kind of a, um, you know, a theory, and it's now turned into an immutable truth, unfortunately. And a lot of this has been driven by the, you know, the, the hyperbolic narratives of America. So if, you know, if this is what we have to deal with, 
Um, is it largely fabrication? Or does the Democratic Party, coastal liberal elites, the snobbery of the New York Times and CNN and MSNBC um, kind of trip over themselves um, trying to um, you know, get a grasp on middle America, but yet at the same time, you know, sort of creating their own jokes, which feeds into the narrative of this great backlash, right? So, you know, with that said, let's kind of jump right into it. The question regarding Kansas and what its matter is, is more than just simply a question of why do people vote against their socioeconomic interests? Kansas has a history that most people don't really remember, right? Kansas is widely regarded, at, you know, in contemporary American culture um, as a solid Republican state, you know, that of which is steeped in cultural conservatism, religious parochialism, and staunch defenders of free market enterprise, right? It's, it's, it's part of the, the general stereotypical Great Plains Republican state that we just have all assumed for years has been a bastion of American cultural conservatism, you know, the small town uh, farmers, the plain spoken churchgoers, you know, things that, you know, people have nothing in common with uh, the Democratic Party. And yet historically, Kansas is known for being sort of a test subject for nearly every progressive and radical political ideology before it became a national issue. Now, it, it, it's sort of um, difficult for one to imagine, to remember, that a century ago, Kansas was a hotbed of radical workers' movements, socialist ideologies, uh, labor union uh, strikes, um, all kinds of popular backlashes against industrialized capitalism. Now, that, that doesn't mean that Kansas was, you know, sort of bleeding heart leftism, but it was certainly a state in which the public made it known very much to the political establishment um, that if there was going to be, any, you know, any kind of uh, accommodation between political and civil society, it is going to have to take place with the approval and the um, uh, the cooperation of um, organized workers unions um, with a number of you know radical social um, and you know pr social provisions and welfare uh, you know social safety networks unemployment insurance um, you know all kinds of things that today you would think would exist more so on the coast you know maybe in Seattle or Philadelphia or New York City certainly not. Um, Kansas. But Kansas is a state with a long history of populism, right? something that we're going to be talking about in this lecture. Populism that was first class-based, more of a blue-collar versus uh, white-collar, um, but, you know, more so now, uh, more of a culturally oriented. Um, but, you know, if populism is, you know, sort of rooted in this us versus them mentality, um, then not much has really changed in Kansas except what the dichotomization is being based on. But what we have noticed um, over the last century, and this has really accelerated, I would say, within, say, the last four or so decades, is the evolution, devolution, however way you want to you know, call it, depending upon your uh, you know, political persuasion, uh, maybe the, the transition, something like that, of the white working class from radical to reactionary, right? This is really the big thing, is that if populism has been um, a major um, element in Kansas political society, it has gone from the more horizontal-based working class versus managerial class populism uh, to more of a cultural dichotomy between um, you know, traditional conservative patriotic Americans uh, versus uh, this composite driven image of the liberal, secular, uh, cosmopolitan urban dweller. So Kansas is a state with an electorate that, at least now, seemingly votes in direct contrast to its vested socioeconomic interests through the support of, as I've already mentioned, a political party that campaigns through the language of preserving traditional cultural values, but when put back in power, legislates policies of predatory capitalism and the disempowerment of the working class. So, you know, it, you know TLDR version, 
the Republican Party has created this ingenious um, strategy in which they will campaign on defense of, you know, home and hearth, um, in defense of, you know, faith, family, freedom, fatherland, you know, gods and guns, right? They, they, they play the cultural narrative when it's time for election season. Once they're in power, they largely eschew these cultural promises and use all their time to continue um, rolling back state-regulated um, institutional provisions on free market enterprise, um, deregulating, defunding all kinds of government assistance programs, and basically working to disenfranchise and undermine the very people that put them in power, right? This is the great paradox. This is the big question that Frank is asking. Like, what is the matter with Kansas? Why are a good number of people knowingly, knowingly and happily voting for a political party that promises them one thing, but has a track record of doing something entirely different? And so, you know, when we understand this, um, we might be able to figure out why the great backlash narrative is such a unifying element in getting the votes every single time. So Frank refers to this collection of cultural conservative beliefs as the great backlash narrative, right? Something that has uh, really be something that began, I think, in the early 1990s, sort of like in the waning years of George Bush the Elder, but, you know, took on this kind of, you know, messianic, um, you know, mission uh, the minute that Bill Clinton uh, became president in 92. The great backlash narrative is, well, it's really more or less a story. The first is the understanding that America has lost its moral compass, right? America has lost its way, it's lost its faith, it's lost its sense of importance. And instead, the country has turned its back on traditional values. Um, it is embracing more of this type of hedonistic lifestyle of secular liberalism that we find in, you know, coastal cities like New York and L.A. and San Francisco and Seattle and Boston, you know, Philadelphia, um, you know, the heartland of America, the traditional fundamental values of what we believe the country once had is being lost quickly. And America's youth no longer loves the country. They no longer feel that um, certain values, whatever they happen to be, and they're, they're never really anything specific, but these values are being disregarded. They're being abandoned. And the, the, the loss of America's moral compass is largely the responsibility of a menagerie of individuals who are actively um, and purposefully working to undermine the system, right? And who are these, you know, who are these perpetrators? Who are the architects of American decay? Um, they're loosely um, regarded as bankers, artists, but of course, you know, um, con uh, conceptual artists, um, not the traditional artists, you know, sort of the avant-garde, in-your-face shock artists. Um, intellectuals, which is a very important word that is differentiated from people who are intelligent. Um, intellectuals are usually, you know, more or less, you know, the egghead academics that have no real use in life. So they just write essay after book and after TED talk that, you know, sort of tells about what the country, what other people should do based on their own sense of, you know, self-aggrandizement. Feminists, globalists, um, foreigners, all of them kind of create this um, ragtag group of people that are united in really only one thing, and that is to weaken the soul of America. Um, and, you know, more often than not, the great backlash will make um, broad stroke references to these people without giving any specific example. Um, you know, every so often, you know, you'll get, you know, a Clinton or an Obama or uh, a George Soros or something like that, right? But more so, it's not just the politician. It's, you know, kind of the everyday urban dwelling activist, you know, the uh, the latte liberal, you know, the one that um, 
is too good for Budweiser, but will drink craft beer. Um, doesn't like um, Dunkin' Donuts coffee, but drinks um, European press um, espresso. Um, you know, has a, a, a taste for artisanal gluten-free cupcakes. Um, turns their thumbs their nose down at Golden Corral and Sizzler and Applebee's and is more in favor of fusion food that, uh, you know, no good, honest, decent American would, you know, consider eating. Um, drives import cars as opposed to American-made automobiles. Um, is more interested in classical music or uh, jazz fusion than country or classic rock, right? So it's this coastal versus heartland, urban versus rural, town, towny versus country dwelling divide. Um, and of course, everybody on the outside are these, you know, weirdos with multiple piercings and tattoos. And of course, what's, you know, come about even more recently is that they are gender fluid and sexually oriented fluid and all other kinds of things, you know, that just fly in the face, deliberately fly in the face of uh, traditional Christian family values and morals, that type of thing, right? Now, of course, this is juxtaposed with the true American, um, the true American in which the narrative says the fate of the country rests with, right? The fate of the country, the future of the country rests with the defenders of a true America that can be found in its heartland, right? And the heartland is never, ever, ever a coastal city. In fact, it's never really a city to begin with. It's usually more or less small town America. Um, you know, usually, you know, when you, especially when you think of those political commercials, you get those idyllic images of some farm in the middle of nowhere, you know, with one of those big windmills or whatever that's turning around and that slow motion view of wheat kind of like dancing in the wind with some setting sun and then maybe have like a silhouette of some tractor, um, you know, driven by some old pawpaw with a, you know, um, you know truck driver hat, you know, with uh, overalls and a plaid shirt and, you know, just, you know, loves America type of thing, right? Again, it's composite image juxtaposed with composite image. And it's the true Heartland Americans that are the ones that uphold traditional family values, um, still adhere to patriotic service and fealty and, you know, and, and, and follow and identify with uh, Christian morals. Of course, when we talk about Christian in this sense, largely we're talking about grassroots, um, sort of non-hierarchical Protestantism. So while Christianity is certainly, you know, collectively welcome, when we think of this type of heartland Christianity, it is not really the establishment churches, but like, you know, the Pentecostals, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Baptists, um, you know, the Mormons is certainly going to be uh, one of those as well, right? We're not really talking about, you know, Roman Catholicism to a degree, certainly not bringing in any kind of Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, when it comes to like Episcopalianism, that tends to be also coastal. That's a little bit too secular for middle American tastes. Uh, Presbyterian might be, you know, certainly might be there. Baptists, absolutely. There's nothing, you know, at, you know, there's nothing wrong with that there. So it's a type of decentralized heartland Protestantism, right? And the true Americans are those that uphold and defend um, what I call the three Fs. Faith, family, and freedom, right? And we'll just leave it at that, right? Faith, family, and freedom. And this adherence is one of the founding underlying beliefs that help us figure out why culture outweighs economics as a public concern. Now, there is a significant part of this narrative that you just have to take on faith, and that is culture trumps economics. Cultural concerns overshadow and take precedent over economic needs. The best way that I can explain this to the uninitiated is that economic problems are going to come and go all the time, right? Some days you're good, some days you're bad, some days you, you know, make money, other days you're in hardship. Culture is one of those do or die moments. 
culture cannot wax or wane like economics. Economics comes with a good or a bad harvest, with a good or bad rainy season. Culture, once it's lost, is almost impossible to bring back. So in that sense, the understanding of the great backlash doesn't openly say disregard economic interests. They just simply put all the attention, all the importance, all the rage that is channeled is on the cultural element, the cultural fate of the country. And so that's why the great backlash narrative might very well be able to rally right, erstwhile progressives to be the foot soldiers of conservatism, right? Now, how is this possible, right? If Kansas and Oklahoma and all these other areas, right, had a history of worker mobilization, of, you know, effectively being the, almost the Praetorian foot soldiers of socialism about a century ago, why are they now upholding principles of traditional parochialism? And the understanding among the great backlash is working class, right? Working class is going to be working class, but working class is also traditional. They're parochial. They're churchgoers. They're family, they're family builders, right? Working class people might be in favor of, you know, empowering small town America, keeping the industrial capitalists out, but they still believe in some kind of patriotism to, if not their country, definitely their local communities. So it's not to say that the working class is racist, and it's not to imply that the working class is homophobic or misogynistic, but when the debate effectively says that it's gays or nothing without any kind of economic uh, you know, incentivization, of rural America, and if the only thing is abortion or gays or gun control, then these individuals are going to default towards traditional modes of living, right? And again, this might be a leap of faith in thinking of, but this is the narrative, especially if the narrative hammers away at cultural identity politics and doesn't really bring up issues of socioeconomic inequity. And while, you know, we can talk about this stuff now in 2020, 2021, I mean, we are basically looking at a book that was published about 15 or so years ago. This is before the rise of a new progressive movement. This is before Bernie Sanders became, you know, sort of a national name. This is before a newer generation of Americans kind of looked beyond identity politics and started rethinking ideas of socialism of, you know, old working class mobility, when the political debate is only identity politics, and there is no difference between Democrats and Republicans over free market private enterprise, then it's natural that the only thing that the two parties differ on is culture, whether it's abortion, gay rights, women empowerment, secularization, separation of church and state, elimination of prayers in public school. Once it's that, the working class is assumed to support more traditional values. This was a gamble that the conservatives have taken, and whether it's that they were right or they just simply demobilized all of the moderates within the Republican Party at this point is inconsequential. What matters is that this is the narrative that has now effectively seized control over much collective identities, preferences, and values in middle America. And I'm going to add, it will continue to monopolize the discourse in so long as the Democratic Party continues to overlook, deride, and dismiss Middle America as nothing more than idiotic foot soldiers for Mitch McConnell. And as long as the Democratic Party thinks that, the Republican Party has an attention-starved audience without any opposing narrative. So in a way, the success of the Great Backlash isn't because it makes sense. It's because it's unopposed. It's because it remains unchallenged. Now, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but within the last five years or so, there has been a credible challenge to this backlash coming more so from the progressive left, not the liberal left. Liberal left is going to stay identity politics. Progressive left is going to talk about 
raising the minimum wage, re-empowering unions, right? sort of returning to working class notions of horizontal class struggle. I don't want to attribute all of this to Bernie Sanders, but he definitely began reviving a series of conversations and debates that had long remained dormant for the previous 35 or so years, right? So that's important to think about, right? That is important to think as we move forward. But for the time being, right, remember, working class might be working class, but they're traditional. And so in a way of understanding this um, uh, you know, sense of cultural conservatism, um, I want to briefly tour the artwork of John McNaughton. Now, some of you may have heard of him before. He has certainly made his rounds on Fox News. Um, he's been noted and simultaneously, you know, ridiculed on late night talk shows like uh, John Oliver and Jimmy Fallon and others, right? John McNaughton is one of those artists that, and I, I have to believe, is so, he's so non-satirical that he has to be satirical. But here's the thing about McNaughton's artwork. It might be hokey. It might be almost, uh, well, I don't even know what to say, you know. But, you know, what I can say is that it's adhered to. It, he has his followers. And in a way, he does a phenomenal, phenomenal job of invoking this sense of real America versus those that hate America. One of his first and probably most popular paintings is this one called One Nation Under God, which, you know, um, as you can see in the, in, in the painting here, there's a you know, depiction of Jesus Christ right in the middle holding the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, you've got little... Timmy over here, you know, who is, you know, really inspired and he wants to know a little bit more about this. And the narrative from this painting is that the declaration is somehow divinely inspired, okay? Largely because of the wording, right? The wording within the preamble says something to the effect of, um, you know, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that, and that, that uh, you know, mankind is endowed with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and they are endowed by their creator, something like that, right? I, I know I'm kind of paraphrasing it here, but this notion of they are endowed by their creator. Man is inherent with a certain set of inalienable rights, and they are endowed by their creator with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? That's right. Endowed by their creator implies that if the United States was founded on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if all three, as the Declaration says, are God-given, then, the narrative goes, the United States has divine religious roots. And therefore, the Founding Fathers were actively and consciously promoting Christian principles. To further that narrative, right, we have Thomas Jefferson, who's standing right here, with the Constitution. Now, the Constitution, which is widely regarded as the most sacred text within the United States, references within its own preamble the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution is built off of the initial actions, the initial rationales for declaring independence and finding a new state. But if the Constitution references the Declaration, which we already will argue is a divine religious text, then the Constitution is basing itself on a divinely oriented text and therefore continues the idea that the United States has religious, specifically Christian roots to it. That is the whole notion of this painting and the idea that a number of key founding fathers like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, oh, here's Ronald Reagan, of course, uh, Betsy Ross, Theodore Roosevelt, here's Benjamin Franklin, uh, Krista McAuliffe is over here, James Madison, James Monroe, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other people like that, right? They all believe this, right? They're, the narrative is, a, is supposedly the, the country was founded on Christian, religious, fundamentally traditional principles. And therefore, this push to separate church and state, this push to promote a sense of liberal secularism, is not only a deviation from the original purposes of the United States of faith, family, and freedom, but is altogether actively anti-Christian. So you see how this narrative 
has been able to kind of bring in a number of existing, pre-existing symbols and narratives to create one larger continuous story. And that helps explain, right, the people that are in the front part of the painting. You have sort of like, the, you know, the good Americans versus the bad Americans, right? The good Americans here are those that will believe in this, in these set of principles. So you have, let's say, and, you know, and, and, the, and the, the stories behind these individuals, you go onto John McNaughton's website, you know, pull up any one of these paintings and hover your cursor over various figures. I got to tell you, the guy might be a little nuts, but he either A, knows what he's doing in terms of web building, or he got the right group to do this because it's an interactive website. So you've got the mother that decided to keep her child as opposed to aborting it. You have the school teacher that somehow looks like Sarah Palin for whatever reason. You've got the Marine. You've got the family doctor. You've got the black student who kind of looks like Martin Luther King, but you know, he's got books in his hand. He's going to do something good for himself. You have the farmer. There's the overalls and the plaid shirt, right? He just finished, you know, um, harvesting wheat. Uh, the family preacher. Uh, and then you have, like, Asians in the back here who are kind of, like, in awe of what they see. But they're on at least the right side of history. But you can kind of get a sense that, you know, they're, you know, sort of humbled at this sense of power and entitlement. Now, on the other side, you've got the damned, um, chief of which here is the Supreme Court judge, um, who has his head in his hands, uh, looking completely and utterly defeated before the, uh, you know, the, the feet of God. And here are a whole bunch of Supreme Court rulings over the years, like Marbury versus Madison, Plessy versus Ferguson, Roe v. Wade, of course, is a big one there, right? And it shows that the Supreme Court, this power of liberal secularism, is powerless against the authority, the traditional authority of God. You've got the unwed mother who is still wondering whether she should abort her baby, and she you can tell she's a little innocent here. She's kind of looking over here and saying, hmm, maybe I should go over there. You have the political campaign manager. You have the college professor who is holding a copy of The Origin of Species in his hands, right? One of the worst things ever written out there because evolution is just, you know, bad, bad, bad. You have the female news reporter who represents the liberal media. You've got the guy with the money who represents political lobbyists. You have the Hollywood movie mogul that, of course, is just infiltrating, you know, the, the minds of the youth with all kinds of horrible, decadent movies and other forms of entertainment. And then if you notice this cloaked character over here that kind of looks like Emperor Palpatine, uh, that's Satan, of course, who is just whispering all sorts of horrible things in the ears of these un-American individuals. But again, the dichotomy, the saved versus the damned, us versus them, cannot be more clear. And, you know, even the artwork itself. I mentioned before, artwork artists might be seen as dangerous to American society. That's conceptual art, right? That's uh, modern art. McNaughton bases his artwork off of traditional, wholesome, you know, Norman Rockwell American art, right? The four, you know, the, the freedom of speech, uh, you know, what is it? The four freedoms that we have here, right? These are, you know, very, very popular images that, of course, been passed around, you know, through, you know, hometown Main Street America since the 1950s. Um, it's this type of artwork, this type of traditional, you know, sort of good housekeeping, um, Saturday evening post type of artwork that is promoted, right? There's nothing inherently... Um, conceptual about any of these things, right? They are as square <laughs> and as, you know, non-satirical um, as possible. So mending the nation is, of course, another important element here. Uh, little Timmy is certainly inspired by the, you know, the teachings of Jesus, who apparently was the original founding father. And he is surrounded by his mother, the family preacher, the local teacher, who is, of course, you know, teaching creationism in school. And once again, the Marine, who could be little Timmy's big brother or his father. But, you know, obviously they're all white. They do not come, I guarantee you, they do not come from San Francisco or Portland, <laughs> Maine or Oregon, does not come from a coastal city, but comes from simple, small-town, heartland America. And this, of course, is juxtaposed with what McNaughton refers to as liberalism as a disease. So he's feeding into, right, the scapegoating, the othering, the demonization 
of a whole bunch of people that within this great backlash narrative are widely known as enemies of the state, right? America haters, liberals, feminists, secularists, cosmopolitans, um, grifters, corrupt individuals, lobbyists, right? And I'm sure that you can recognize a number of these people here. Al Gore in the front, Keith Olbermann, Rosie O'Donnell, uh, there's Whoopi Goldberg, James Carville, um, Rachel Maddow, Jesse Jackson, Michael Moore, um, Chris Matthews, Al Sharpton, Sean Penn, Katie Couric, Matt Lauer, um, you know, who else? George Clooney over here. Um, what's interesting is that McNaughton threw in both an, ele an elephant and a donkey as a way of trying to show that, you know, there's corruption on, you know, within both parties, although most of these individuals here will vote Democrat. What's interesting about the notion of throwing in the Republican elephant is that this is not the Republican Party per se, but the Republican moderate. The Republican moderate, the one that um, puts free market enterprise above traditional cultural values. So, you know, the great backlash narrative, which began as kind of this grassroots, um, very conservative activist movement in the 1990s, targeted first the Republican Party before it went after the Democrats. And it targeted moderate Republicans who apparently were too rich too aristocratic, too elitist to care about the poorer, more rural areas of America that the conservative elements claimed, whether the people who live there or not knew it, but claimed to speak on their behalf. So in this sense, liberalism, according to McNaughton, and according to many of these cultural conservative icons, is something that isn't necessarily part of the Democratic Party, although the Democratic Party itself is just, you know, the spawn of Satan, but it carries over into, right, even um, moderate Republicans like Mitt Romney or John McCain or even, you know, George W. Bush in some cases, Bob Dole, definitely, right? You know, we're, we're talking about your pre-Tea Party Republican, right? Those that haven't, um, you know, kind of bought completely into uh, this, this, this fanatical, uncompromising version of, you know, traditional America uh, versus everyone else, right? But you can kind of get already the sense, you know, in the visuals. It's us the good ones versus those that openly, actively, unapologetically, and unceasingly seek to destroy America with all kinds of decadent values that go against the principles of what it means to be an American until <laughs> Donald Trump comes in. And I think this is when McNaughton's artwork just kind of took an extra leap of insanity because while he overwhelmingly hated, despised Obama as being, he might as well have been one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Donald Trump is seen within this narrative and again, it's something that you just got to accept on faith. D don't ask why. Try not to think too much about it. Otherwise, you're going to just keep racking your head wondering how this works. Donald Trump is seen as the savior, the one who is going to make America great again. Forget the fact that Donald Trump represents absolutely nothing like traditional religious fundamental America, right? Donald Trump represents everything that go, everything about greed and hedonism and, you know, misogyny. But for whatever reason, the narrative just takes him, his wife, Melania, and just sees them as the greatest Americans since the Reagans. In fact, probably even better than the Reagans because he's got so much that he had to restore and make better again. How this works, I don't know. Just for the sake of moving forward, accept it as part of that narrative. But this is, right, and I'm sure just by looking at the symbolism, right, you're able to figure out, yeah, 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 I know exactly this type of uh, way of thinking. And you might, as I said, ridicule it. You might find it to be so ridiculous that it's not worth paying attention to. But once again, I got to say, this stuff gets elections won. This stuff has millions of followers. This stuff is represented through television, radio, websites, literature, books, pamphlets, you name it. And left unopposed, large parts of America are going to take this because this stuff is given to them, lock, stock, and barrel, and that's what they're going to believe because there's nothing else to believe. And when 
they are, um, you know, called out by the Democratic Party or by the so-called liberal elites, the narrative already has a fail-safe built in, which says at some point you're going to be ridiculed for being religious. You're going to be laughed at for being patriotic. You're going to be seen as a little dumb for, you know, supporting family values. We know this. Anticipate that. They're going to come after you because they're jealous, because they hate you. So rather than take the ridicule and be introspective, adherence to the great backlash, dig in their heels even further, entrench themselves even further, and are able to withstand, right, attack after attack. So with this sense, right, the great backlash is more than just simply a cultural narrative. It is a way of creating a political bulwark that creates election after election just fanatically loyal supporters of anyone and anything Republican. And might I add, more recently, since the Republican Party is now becoming more and more under the control of this narrative of Trump, it really is, you know, an unstoppable force of, you know, sort of Trump-oriented right-wing Republicans. So what's the purpose? The purpose is to create and identify a group of traditional conservative Americans as, and identify them as the cultural backbone of the country, and then juxtapose that group with another group of collective urban political elites who overlook and deride them as irrelevant, backwards, and uneducated. It is a way of turning the um, sense of moral superiority 180 degrees, right, right on its head. It's that the people in the countryside are the actual moral superiors, not the urban dwelling liberal elites who go to school and study political science here and there, but lose elections, you know, one year after the other. It is small town America that holds the keys to America's future. So it's an us-them divide. Us, the good guys, them, the bad guys, the evil ones, the ones that are just relentlessly trying to destroy the country. So this us-them divide, as I've mentioned earlier, is really an updated form of populism. Right? It's a form of populism that is used to capture an electorate within a collective cultural identity. So I think that after all this talk about populism, right, it's worth examining. It's what exactly is this? Because populism is a term that has been used almost as a veritable buzzword to describe any kind of unconventional, um, charismatic, um, non-status quo political movement that attacks establishment politics, policies, and leaders. With that, I don't want to denigrate populism. I honestly believe that populism is sort of a natural response. It's a type of natural reaction within the structure of democracy against what its adherents believe to be abuses of power, especially by state organs, right? So populism is a kind of response to, by those who believe that democracy has gone astray, right? That, the, that politics have gone corrupt, that politics have become captured by a group of small political elites and oligarchs and are using democracy as a way of furthering their own interests at the expense of everyone else. So populism is a type of rage from below. It's a type of reaction, um, sort of like a visceral gut reaction um, with a progressive agenda, right? An agenda that will seek to attack the elite-driven status quo, you know, kick the so-called proverbial fat cats out of power um, and return power to the people, right? Return power, restore what the country was originally set out to do. Now, populism as a political practice originally began as an element of the left, right? Left-wing populism, this type of classical populism, farmers versus industrialists, small town versus big capital corporate interests, has a, it's a very uniquely American way of responding to the abuses of capitalism that we would normally regard Marxists or socialists doing in Europe at the same time. But more recently, um, populism has kind of evolved, again, evolved, devolved, however way you want to look at it, 
um, into something that is a lucrative tool by the right. So populism originally began as a left-wing movement, advancing ideas of social justice, social welfare, workers' empowerment, disenfranchisement of the industrial class, the blue-collar versus the white-collar. Right-wing populism, on the other hand, has kind of made this, you know, from the socioeconomic to the socio-cultural, right? So original agrarian populism okay, has more of a class-based distinction between the agrarian sectors of the countryside and the industrial and intellectual classes of the urban centers. This is very much Kansas of the late 19th, early 20th century, where movements, especially proto-socialist movements, right, envisioned um, some kind of gradual development of working class social democracy. Right? In a parallel universe, Eugene Debs you know, became president. Um, you know, workers' unions, labor movements bega- you know, took on more and more strength. And ultimately, if they didn't you know, overturn the principles of market capitalism, certainly would have done a lot more to create a social democratic, um, socialist-oriented um, economic model than what the New Deal envisioned uh, in the 1930s. But, you know, sort of beyond that, agrarian populism has a lot of normative traditional qualities to it as well. So, you know, more than just simply responding to large-scale capitalism, agrarian populism seeks the preservation of small family farms and businesses, right? So in that sense, right, they're a fan of, if not limited government, certainly local government, right? Certainly local government, Um Populism, in this sense, also works to defend the rights of workers as well as worker self-management, right? So we're also talking about the laborers, the blue collars, controlling the modes of production. Very much, again, Marxism. It's kind of like American-driven Marxism, but without the Marxism itself. Um, With the understanding that the peasantry was the foundation of the economy, so, you know, populism in this sense is very much a sense of agrarianism, right? The farmer, the local farmer, the local farmer's market, the local farmer uh, produce is what will sustain uh, communities throughout the country. We don't need these big industrialized firms. We don't need these factories. They shut down small businesses. They disenfranchise farmers. They destroy the landscape. They overcultivate. The land, they, um, you know, inject all kinds of preservatives and hormones into the meat. You know, the food quality goes down, right? Small local, you know, everybody should just kind of be like a local Amish uh, farmer's market, right? And everybody will be good. Now, national populism is a different story. National populism is a more recent phenomenon. In the United States, it really begins around 1990, 91, 92. I mean, we're talking really about... You know, the waning years of George W. Bush the Elder, but when Clinton wins that shock victory in 92, um, it takes the conservative world by storm because here is a guy who, you know, is a complete departure from the Reagan-Bush years of service to the country, an older World War II generation. You know, Clinton's one of the hippies from the 60s, uh, a draft dodger, a pot smoker, a womanizer, a saxophone player, you know, the young whippersnappers like him. And how could he possibly win against George H.W. Uh, Bush? Well, it happened. And this kind of creates this <laughs> paranoid feeling among many evangelical Christians who believe that this guy is going to just kind of destroy the country. He's going to turn it into just a, you know, he's going to turn it into one big San Francisco or, uh, you know, New York City. So while it doesn't begin with the intention of national populism, we can kind of retroactively look at what cultural conservatism is and say, yeah, it, it has a lot of similar features to that of these, you know, right wing um, populist parties of Europe. And in this sense, the us them divide is turned 90 degrees into an ethnic based distinction, not class based, but ethnic based between true and disloyal members of the community. 
Now, there still is this um, emphasis on, you know, the worker, the farmer, but it's not just the worker or farmer. It's the white worker, the white farmer, right? It's the ordinary people still versus privileged elites, but ordinary versus privileged, country versus town, conservative versus liberal, now has a significant element of xenophobia, ethnocentrism, and anti-globalism. So when, you know, right-wing pundits talk about America lovers versus America haters, they're not going to mention this specifically, but you can read between the lines that there is a large degree of white ethnocentrism. I'm not going to go so far as to say white supremacy, although some of them definitely approach that, like, you know, Representative Stephen King or Tom Cotton or whatever it is. You know, they're definitely, you know, softcore white supremacists. But they will harness this type of ethnocentrism within the idea of, you know, returning power to the people, getting rid of the corruption, the elitism, the oligarchism. But in this sense, the elitism isn't necessarily capitalism or industrialism. It's secular progressivism. It's immigration, globalization, cosmopolitanism, feminism, um, you know, abortion, um, gender fluidity, um, gay rights, um, you know, all sorts of what we can kind of call woke politics today. Um, that is what is being juxtaposed from, right? And according to the national populist, you know, and this is your typical, you know, Fox News pundit or watcher, is that it is right, it, it's patriotism safeguarding against liberalism, leftism, Marxism, and all of them, all three of these, right, are portrayed as systemic threats to the state um, and to society with really no discernible difference. You know, I mean, today, among sort of a growing sense of political leftism, which has its own internal divisions and problems and weaknesses, which I'm not going to get into right now. You've got DSA, you've got, you know, more of a, you know, communist socialist group of people. You got those that, you know, you know, start and stop with Bernie. You got those that say that Bernie doesn't go far enough. You've got, you know, 8 million different varieties of left-wing politics in this country, which, you know, if you're a right-winger listening to this lecture, you can rest assured knowing that none of them are ever going <laughs> to take control because we're all too internally divided. But these groups will viscerally detest being lumped in with Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, um, any of those, right? National populism doesn't give a damn, right? As far as national populism is concerned, right? And you can listen to Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, you know, whoever, right? Joe Biden might as well be Joseph Stalin, right? Joe Biden, easily one of the most conservative Democrats in modern memory, right? More conservative than Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. I mean, you know, the guy is just basically one cough away from just becoming a Republican, for God's sake. Um, you know, the national populist narrative will regard Joe Biden as just another, you know, socialist out to destroy America. And, you know, whether the term is socialism or liberalism, these are, you know, negative connotations, almost to the point of being used as you know, like, like, like a slur, right? Liberalism is a mental disorder. Socialism is a virus. It's overtly un-American. In fact, it's anti-American. Socialism is regarded as, you know, it's kind of put on the same level as some of the worst aspects of Stalinism, of North Korea. You know, I mean, there's no one here in the country that wants to, you know, invoke Stalinism. I mean, but those that want, let's say, a $15 minimum uh, wage raise, universal health care, and a Green New Deal, well, I mean, you know, for, you know, today, Green New Deal, tomorrow, the Gulag, you know, according to this narrative. So national populism, um, it's not necessarily... Um, synonymous with the Great Backlash, but the Great Backlash does take on um, elements of these national populist dichotomies, right? And we find these parties, um, you know, across the board in Canada, 
in Europe, both Western and Eastern, right? They are parties that adhere to principles of traditional identity and cultural values, and that is a way of keeping out the immigrants, uh, staving the tide of global cosmopolitanism. Interestingly enough, national populist uh, parties in Europe are big proponents of social welfare policies, right? They just simply want social welfare policies for the ethnic kin of that country, right? So it's like, you know, the Austrian Freedom Party um, is, you know, Austria for the Austrians, but they're absolutely in favor of universal health care for Austrians, maternity and paternity leave for Austrians, clean air and clean water for Austrians. National populists in the United States, on the other hand, right, we haven't made that leap yet, right? National populists think of all of that stuff as you know, itty bitty, you know, touchy feely socialism, liberalism, none of that stuff is good. So when we talk about national populists in the United States, they are far more to the right, far more to the right than anything that you'd even find um, in many of these Western, Central or Eastern European uh, political parties. Um, Just one more quick, um, you know, differentiation before we move on, just so we're all on the same page. The differences in original and national populism is in where the conflict is perceived. So agrarian populism, which may very well see rudimentary comeback with someone like Bernie Sanders, who definitely talks about conflict as horizontally based class structure, right? Bernie is kind of bringing back the earlier days of working class solidarity versus, you know, oligarchism, right? He's certainly not ethnocentric in that sense. National populism is. National populism views conflict between vertically-based ethnic communities. Um, And while it's not a one-to-one comparison here, agrarian populism in modern American politics, Bernie Sanders, national populism, the closest that we've ever gotten, that's your Ted Cruz, your Donald Trump, um, your Marco Rubio, you know, those individuals, right? But, you know, definitely Donald Trump. People like to say that Trump was a, you know, neo-fascist. I think that that's giving him way too much credit. Um, I think he's just more of a debased populist um, who uses culture as a way of getting ahead, even though when he's in power, he does all of these draconian economic policies that disenfranchise the people that say that they would literally lay down their life for this guy, Okay. So these parties, the narrative of the Great Backlash, and what is increasingly becoming the Republican Party, at least at the cultural level during the campaigning season, are those that model themselves as anti-establishment parties of no, right? They are more against than what they are for. Right? Euphemistically, they're kind of for these ambiguous ideas, as I said, faith, family, and freedom. But when it comes to socialized medicine, no. When it comes to legal abortion, no. When it comes to legal marijuana, no. When it comes to an increase in minimum wage, no. When it comes to environmental protection policies, no. When it comes, you get the idea, no, 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 no. Um, In addition to that, right, anti-establishment identities are against the current status quo, whatever that happens to be. Now, interestingly enough, the Republican Party has ingeniously projected itself to many people in this country as the anti-establishment party, even though they are the establishment. They are much more the establishment than the Democratic Party is, especially when we look at economics as opposed to culture. But they will project themselves as anti-establishment, even though they lack any kind of real, you know, long-term goals and objectives. I mean, they're not going to roll back things that they campaign on rolling back, because once they do that, they can't campaign on it anymore. Um, But, you know, so, you know, you'll you'll campaign on ending abortion. That's never going to happen. You're going to campaign on uh, reversing the trends on... Uh, gay marriage, right? Again, that's not going to happen, right? The most that you could do is, you know, stack the courts with conservative reactionary uh, judges. But again, at the end of the day, um, you know, the country is led by conservative establishment elites who, for, again, reasons that you just got to take on faith, uh, project themselves to ordinary voters as men of the people, as ordinary, straight-talking people who believe in our cause, even though there's no empirical proof to show that. This also plays into 
the um, you know, elements of anti-intellectualism. As I mentioned before, there's a difference between intellectual and into, no, there's a difference between someone who is intelligent and someone who is an intellectual. Okay? The intellectual, so when we say anti-intellectual, we're not talking about you know, pro-stupid. We're not talking about advancing the concept of idiocracy, although in some cases it almost seems that way, right? Intellectualism are, you know, those, you know, egghead um, talking heads on TV, you know, and the people who uh, work in, you know, some liberal think tank, some liberal arts college or university, you know, those people that spend far too much time writing articles and publishing books on things that they couldn't possibly do, you know, anything useful in their own life. So, you know, it's the condescending editorial writing egghead that uh, will ask what's the matter with Kansas, in which that question will be turned around to the people of Kansas saying, you see what the New York Times, what the Washington Post, what um, MSNBC thinks about you? They think you're stupid. Well, who the hell are they to judge you good, honest, hardworking, decent, intelligent individuals, right? An intelligent person is one who can fix a car, who can change a tire, who can change oil. An intellectual is someone who would basically starve to death if they had a job outside of tenured academia or the New York Times op-ed page, right? These people are functionally useless as far as the narrative goes. So anti-intellectualism is, you know, I, is a way of thinking that speaks for the ordinary, plain-spoken people, right? People who don't usually reside in urban centers um, or at least are not members of the privileged class. And I think that this was on full display in the 2004 presidential election between the plain-spoken people's president, George W. Bush, and the blue-blooded, aristocratic, elitist, haughty, um, narcissistic John Kerry, right? And I mean, it, you couldn't have gotten a bigger dichotomy. Um, and the more that people ridiculed Bush for being gaff-ridden, somebody who tripped over his own words, you know, someone who was a little dumb, that's played out in conservative circles as elites making fun of our ordinary guy. Now, forget the fact that Bush comes from one of the most privileged, richest, and politically connected families in the country. Forget the fact that his family doesn't come from Texas, but from Maine, you know, from New England, and kind of relocated to Texas to cosplay as cowboy ranchers. That's lost in the narrative. The fact that Bush has, an, has a ranch, has a little cowboy hat, you know, and look, ultimately, he's a nice guy. You know, George W. Bush might be, you know, somebody that committed horrible war crimes, but he's somebody that you'd have a beer with. He's somebody that would totally come to your barbecue and Laura would bring, you know, a Tupperware of macaroni salad. You know, there's nothing, there's, there's no question about that. John Kerry and his wife, Teresa Hines Kerry, because she needs to use that name to indicate that she's part of the Hines family, you know, her, her you know, the wife ma makes the ketchup or whatever it is, right? They're elitist, they're cold, they really don't know what to do outside of a five-star restaurant. And I can tell you this much, and you know, I, re I remember this as if it was you know about a month or two ago, during the '04 um, election, and it was you know this type of hyper American nationalism was at an all-time high, right? We're talking about um, you know support the war, support the troops in Iraq. Uh, Team America: World Police came out a couple of years earlier, which I thought was just a brilliant, brilliant film. Um, and you know, to be a liberal, to be that aristocratic, elite-driven other, you know, is somebody who also um, sympathized with those that protested against the Iraq War, right? And that's another one of the things that you just don't do. You do not, um, you do not protest the troops. It doesn't matter why we're there or what the reasons were, right? You support our boys. That's just what it was. Forget the fact that George W. Bush was a draft dodger. Forget the fact that John Kerry was a Vietnam War vet, with Purple Heart, 
right? He was a decorated war veteran. Forget that. That doesn't matter into this whole equation. What matters is that John Kerry was perceived to have been against the war. And when he was questioned on this, he had this idiotic statement where he said, I was for the war before I was against it, which, of course, is just going to be ridiculed in conservative media circles as someone who is just flip-flopping or trying to say something, anything, to be loved by people who are not going to vote for him anyway. It doesn't matter. John Kerry could have been somewhere to the left of Bernie Sanders. He could have been even more conservative than Joe Biden. He's part of the Democratic Party. He's an intellectual. And this is where I was going to get with this. John Kerry at one point, I forget where this was. It was some press conference or whatever it was, but it was, this ended his campaign. Like this, this killed his credibility. He says in so many words, something like, um, I just came back from a three week vacation um, in the French uh, Riviera. And I was automatically like strike one. It's a sort of like, okay, first of all, this dude has a three week vacation and he goes to France like, the worst country in the world for American patriotism at that point. Like, at that point, if we had, like, you know, the president of France and Osama bin Laden tied up in a room with a gun, we probably would have shot the president of France at the time, you know? And, you know, he said, okay, well, I came back from, you know, Paris sailing on the French Riviera, right? That's strike one. And all of my friends in France, strike two, told me they want me to be the new president, that they hope that I got elected, now, that was the kiss of death, because that is now broadcast into every Fox News watching, Rush Limbaugh listening, conservative talk radio disseminating, you know, decentralized Protestant church gathering group of people with the following message. John Kerry is now endorsed by France, and there is one thing that every red-blooded, meat-eating American will not tolerate— and that is being told what to do by somebody outside of the country, right? Just, just the absolute kiss of death. Kerry could have given the country everything that it needed. Doesn't matter, right? He was seen as a traitor. He was seen as somebody who was basically now the French are rooting for him. Fuck that. That's the type of anti-intellectualism that these parties like to espouse, right? You think you're smart, but you end up making an ass of yourself when you're trying to relate to us at our little general store or our little diner, and you clearly have no idea what the hell you're doing. <clears throat> so anti-intellectualism has a large amount of anti-cosmopolitanism as well. That does give one pause to think that there is elements of crypto-nativism. I don't want to say racism. Right? It's, it's a little risky to say racism, per se, in the, in the way that we know it. But crypto-nativism is kind of, you know, America for the Americans. And yeah, there is a tinge of, you know, white ethnocentrism, which is certainly on display when these parties promote, um, you know, policies that are, you know, against identity politics, um, especially those advocating diversity and inclusion, Right? They're against political correctness. They're against um, you know, things like, well, we have to kind of desacralize the Christmas season because we might offend the, the two Jewish families and the one atheist family uh, down the block. When in reality, <clears throat> right, there's really few cases where non-Christians get offended by Christmas. But it's the idea that the liberal establishment wants to take away Christmas, take away your nativity scene, take away your Christmas Christmas songs, take away your Starbucks Christmas cups, and just kind of make this, you know, innocuously mishmash of a winter holiday season. We're not even going to call it a Christmas tree. We're going to call it a holiday tree. And that's the stuff that drives these people nuts. <clears throat> like, it's just, you know, every year we like to, th oh, oh, here it is, the war on Christmas, here it goes. Is there an actual assault on Christmas? No. Is there an actual attempt at removing Christmas? Of course not. It's a money-making holiday. There are people who aren't even Christian who celebrate Christmas. But the narrative, which remains unopposed and unchallenged, is that the liberal establishment is working to take away your Christmas. Oh, and even better, replace it with, like, Ramadan or, um, you know, Diwali, or um, Festivus, or Kwanzaa, or something else like that, right? No one's ever going to say we're going to replace it with Hanukkah, right? And again, Judaism is off limits, because God forbid we should sound anti-Semitic. But it's this belief that 
if we live in a country today in which cultural diversity is no longer something that needs to be assimilated into, but keep your language, keep your culture, keep your food, keep your customs, keep this, keep that, right? The anti-establishment element of national populism says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Irish gave up their identity. The Germans gave up their identity, right? The Scots gave up their identity all for the purpose of being American. They gave up their language to speak English. Now, mind you, mind you, people from Latin America, from Asia, whatever it is, it's not like they can't speak English. And even if they do come here as that first, you know, immigrant generation, their children are going to speak English. That's just a God-given fact. But the idea that there's so many and that they, you know, there's enough of them where they don't um, have to speak English, but they can speak their own native language to themselves. Like, this is no different than Germans in early modern America or with the Irish speaking Gaelic. But in an age of 24-7 medium and, you know, social media and other elements, this type of immigrant characteristic is much more pronounced than it was back then. So if these groups can keep their identities and their, you know, festivals and their heritage parades, shouldn't we, the white people, have our own heritage as well? And the minute, of course, that you start talking about white heritage or white history month or white pride, you know, that all, that, the, these are cringe phrases, which, of course, is going to get a backlash from the liberal establishment. It's almost as if these narratives are deliberately designed to piss off the other side to keep that dichotomy, to keep that us-them divide going. But it is much easier then to be a party that advocates what you are against than what you are for. If you say what you're against, we're against cosmopolitanism, we're against secularism, we're against intellectual, we're against all that kind of stuff, you're going to get a whole bunch of people that have various beliefs about what they would like, but they're all united in what they're against. Another ingenious element of the great narrative backlash. One other important aspect of this is that if we were to keep within our vocabulary of class and our understanding of collective memory, the great backlash advocates a type of restorative collective memory, right? Make the country great again. That's the reason why Donald Trump was so unbelievably popular in 2016. Right? His campaign slogan, Make America Great Again, had to have been one of the most powerful and persuasive slogans in modern American political history. Right? You know, you juxtapose that with Hillary stronger together. I don't even know what the hell that means. Or Biden, build back better. I don't even know what that means. Right? Make America Great Again implies that America was great at some point, but it had lost that edge. Right? And that fits right into the narrative of the Great Backlash. Right? America was once good, but we lost our way. We lost our morals. We lost our values. So the idea here is that the great backlash glorifies, remembers, gets nostalgic for a proverbial golden age, wherever it happens to be. Maybe it's the 80s under Reagan or the 50s. Whatever it happens to be, it's an age gone by. And, you know, this golden age may not have actually ever existed, right? The glorification of Ronald Reagan to the point of almost, you know, deifying him among cultural conservatives in the country today is very different from the Ronald Reagan that actually existed. And even when people romanticize about how great America was in the 1950s, for instance, right? This is a selective remembering of the past. It's great if you were white and male. If you were a female, you know, get back in the kitchen and cook. If you were a minority, this is the age of segregation. Um, and, you know, not only that, but people talk about the 1950s as this fantastic period. It's also the period of polio. It's the period of the iron lung. It's the period of measles. It's the period of smallpox still. Um, but these things are never remembered when a past is nostalgified, glorified in that sense. And so when we talk about restoring um, some element of the country... Right? We are talking about the restoration of a way of life that never really existed in this incantation, but it's enough to get people to know that the current period sucks. Right? The current period is not where we want to go. We want to go back to traditional values. We want to go back to the way things at one point were. And in doing so, we will blame the current problems of political, economic, social, cultural dysfunctionality on the ruling government. Right? So who do we blame? We blame the Democrats. We blame Obama. 
we blame Bill Clinton. We'll even blame moderate Republicans who are, you know, likely to cooperate with these people. Now, restorative collective memory doesn't openly advocate taking America back by violent means, um, although those that stormed the Capitol in early January of this year might have thought otherwise, but it does look favorably on those who engage in some kind of patriotic vigilantism, you know? Like, you know, the cake store owner that refuses to sell a wedding cake to a gay couple, right? That's take one for traditional America. Or that clerk, I forget in which uh, state she was in, Kim Davis, who refused to issue marriage licenses to people who were gay because of her religious conviction that marriage is between a man and a woman, right? And she was willing to risk her job, knowing full well that even if she was fired, the conservative elements of the country would have guaranteed that she found a job afterwards. She became a martyr, a celebrity for the cause. All you got to do is get on, you know, Sean Hannity, and you are a crusader for this type of, you know, long forgotten Norman Rockwellian, John McNaughton America, right? So those that, you know, defy uh, conventional norms, those that um, choose to, you know, embrace hokiness for the sake of traditional values, right? If that makes me ridiculed by the New York Times op-ed section, if that gets me um, made fun of on Saturday Night Live, that's a badge of honor as far as they're concerned, right? Because these people are, you know, beyond help and hope anyway. So restorative collective memory is a large part of this great backlash, right? America had these values. They need to be brought back or they need to be safeguarded in areas where they still exist. Now, with all of that said, you might be thinking to yourself, none of this stuff makes real sense, especially when what is advocated is never really implemented, you know? Like, you know, those that, you know, call themselves the biggest Christians out there, you know, warriors of God, whatever it is, right? are those that engage in usury, those that will bankrupt and disenfranchise the poor at moment's notice, those that call for the return of traditional values in America are those that will actively work to undermine traditional rural mom-and-pop America once they're in power. So there's a great paradox to this great backlash, right? And from the outside, we kind of see the disconnect, because the great backlash is, if anything, a redirection of collective social anger from earlier issues of socioeconomic inequality towards sociocultural immorality. Right? So in other words, the great backlash, if it has a purpose beyond dichotomizing us versus them, it is to reshape and redirect grievances, problems, anger away from economic and say, hey, um, before we talk about $15 minimum wage, before we talk about uh, whether or not this uh, little factory uh, in middle America is going to survive or be outsourced, need I remind you, there are people on Tumblr that are now calling for the official recognition of a third, fourth, and fifth gender. Can you believe that? Oh my God. America's going down the toilet here, right? Can you believe that we are now allowing transvestites to read children's stories in libraries? Where is this country going to, right? So the idea is to obfuscate, is to redirect anger away from economic inequity and more towards this sense of cultural decadence, um, you know, which is used rather successfully by socio-political elites to achieve continuing these economic goals of inequity. You know, tax breaks for the rich, disenfranchisement of the poor, environmental rollbacks, safety regulations are being dismantled, forget social security, just more and more and more money for the rich. These things go in direct, these things go against the direct interests of those who are made culturally outraged. So we will, in other words, we will piss off a large segment of the population to think that the country is about to lose its moral ways. We get them to vote for us with the promise that we will preserve these ways of life, 
And once we're back in office, we don't really do anything about that. We just continue to roll back economic regulations, disenfranchise as much as possible. And you can kind of see some of the biggest supporters of the Republican Party come from the most impoverished, you know, dilapidated counties in the country. I know that a lot of times on the internet, right, the, you know, the right-wing media likes to point to, um, you know, Detroit. Oh, look at what happens when a Democrat is in power. It's like, I'm not defending the Democratic Party at all, but it's like Detroit has nothing to do with the Democrats. It has nothing to do with socialism. It has nothing to do, if there was socialism, the workers at the auto, at the, you know, at the, at the automobile factories would have been able to defend their jobs from being moved overseas. That's economic deregulation. That's free market fundamentalism. That's the stuff that the Republican parties ascribe to lock, stock and barrel, right? It's that type of free market fundamentalism of Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek that believe in the principle and the existence of the invisible hand, right? These are people that read only the first chapter of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, realized it was a long book. Hell, even the first chapter is pretty long, got bored and figured that's all I really need to know, <laughs> you know? And that's all we really didn't need to know about market capitalism, which of course is fundamentally flawed and wrong. Hence the reason why we see year after year the pushing of privatization, deregulation, deunionization, all of these things directly affect the livelihood of many ordinary American supporters. This economically disenfranchises them. This gets them angry. That anger is turned towards culture for whatever reason. We vote for the very party that disenfranchises them, but the party will promise to keep the gay pride parade from marching down your boarded up, emptying, depopulated town center. Okay? The welfare state remains demonized because that's just, you know, mooching. Taxation is promoted as theft. You know, one of the big things of libertarianism, right? Um, one's hard-earned money, but rarely raised and barely affordable income. But taxation is theft, despite the fact that taxation goes to many of these services. Roads, schools, infrastructure, social welfare, all that stuff has been now deregulated and defunded. Public services, which of course are now inefficient, they're run down, they're now branded as, well, you see, public services, just that's government for you. They don't know how to operate. Look at how shitty the buses are. Look at how crappy the trains run. Is this what you want? Is this, is you want the government running your lives? It's not that the government doesn't know what to do. It's that the public services are so woefully underfunded that they're naturally about one, you know, clusterfuck away from breaking down. But we tend to forget <laughs> know that these services are woefully underfunded and we'll just point to the after effect saying look at how bad the buses the roads the things everything else is is this more do you want more government in your lives it's a fantastic fantastic way of pulling the wool over the eyes of the electorate and as long as the electorate is you know bombarded every night on TV or through radio or through their religious groups or through pamphlets or whatever it happens to be of this so-called establishment, right, ruining the country amid economic empowerment, then the more tax breaks for the rich will happen unopposed. Unions and workplace safety programs will be seen as somehow positive as opposed to negative because unions and worker safety, that's government regulation and somehow that's considered to be bad. Wildlife preserves will be defunded because, hey, in the words of Rush Limbaugh, screw the spotted owl. You know, there's oil in them, their mountains and then their rivers or whatever. Let's drill, baby, drill. You know, forget the polar bear, forget, you know, global warming is a myth concocted by Obama anyway, right? And public education. Who needs it? It's just liberal indoctrination that is meant to, you know, denigrate and brainwash the youth um, into hating America. Um, hence the reason why a lot of these groups call for the establishment of charter schools, parochial schools, home schools. Um, and that's not to say that public school is a bastion of empirical truth, but an underfunded public school is going to underperform. And when it underperforms, you can be absolutely certain 
that Fox News, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, you know, whoever they are, are going to look at those underfunded schools and say, you see, public services just simply don't work, right? It is just a way of controlling the discourse from start to finish. And you might think that this is the worst thing out there. It may very well be, but man, it is ingenious. Again, you think Murica's dumb? Uh Uh-uh. Murica is a hell of a lot more organized and smart than any of these liberal egghead writers for the New York Times think that they are. So by this point, you're probably then wondering, all right, how does this work? And more importantly, why? (laughs) Like, come on, someone's got to notice at this point that we're being duped. Someone at this point's got to point out and say, hey, you're being lied to. This is utter bullshit. I mean, that's ultimately what it is. It's that it is just a chronic amount of nonsensical BS. So someone's got to, at some point, realize, dude, we're in a matrix here. You know, someone take the red pill and, you know, wake up. How and why does this work? Again, there's a few reasons, Um, none of which are the definitive answer, but it's enough to think about. It's enough to you know, give some degree of credibility. The first, as I've already said, the Republican Party, um, and I say this as somebody who used to be right wing, right? I say this as someone who used to, you know, vote unapologetically conservative, right? I listened to Rush. I listened to Sean back in the day. I kind of drew the line at Mark Levin. I just kind of thought that his voice was annoying. Um, But yeah, Fox News, the fair and balanced, liberal bias in the media, blah, 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 right? Okay. Um... The Republican, I say this by saying what I say right now, the Republican Party has no regard for democracy whatsoever. They have no regard for social welfare. It is a party that is overwhelmingly self-serving and it operates largely on a number of voters that are just led to believe whatever it is that the Republican Party wants you to believe about the country. And yet you might think to yourself, that is diabolical. Yeah, it is diabolical, but you know what? It's ingenious. Between the two parties, the Republican Party is a hell of a lot smarter when it comes to political strategy. It doesn't mean that they're moral, not by any stretch of the imagination. But when you think 30 plus years of conservative talk radio reaching out to an audience that is starved for attention, right? and produces a series of convincing narratives that get people to think in some ways, oh my God, he's saying what I'm thinking. He says what I've long believed, right? This is Rush, is one of the first ones, right? Rush Limbaugh, I, you know, again, I kind of you know, have a love-hate relationship because the guy was very, very savvy when it came to reaching an audience of millions of people a day. Before there was Fox, Before there was Sean, there was Rush. And in that way, there is now just, you know, dozens and dozens of Rush Limbaugh's out there. Sean Hannity, Mark Levin, um, uh, what's her name? Um, Laura Ingram, um, Alex Jones. I mean, these are just some of the big ones, not to mention the local ones. You know, you listen to some of these things and it's, I got to admit, some of this stuff is bordering on the verge of paranoia, almost hate speech. That's a tough, that's a big word to say. But again, you take out the word liberal, you take out the word Democrat, and you put in Jew, you put in black, you put in Muslim. And this stuff is, this stuff will enrage the audience listener. But unopposed, right? It is a narrative that is unopposed uh, by the coastal elites. And when the coastal elites, when the New York Times, the Washington Post, the you know Politico, um, the Hill, CNN, you know, try to respond to denigrate what can they say they can't really say anything except these people are dumb and their audience members are gullible right hillary clinton's whole basket of deplorable statements might have been you know not entirely wrong but that was turned around brilliantly by right-wing media and said oh hillary clinton easily one of the most hated and despised people among the conservative right called all of you good, free-thinking, straight-talking, plain-acting Americans deplorables. And who is this coming from? Right? The latte liberals, the Volvo-driving, abortion-supporting feminazi, right? 
and will come up with all kinds of epithets for these enemies of America that most of these people who are listening have never really met. They might see them on TV. They might associate them with Hollywood. They might hear about them in some sensationalist story through their conservative talk radio show, but they never actually know them directly. But more often than not, right, another big issue, and this is something that I think is equally, if not even more important, and that is the Democratic Party has done nothing, absolutely nothing, to reach out to this audience for the past 30 or so years, right, since the early 1990s. The conservative wing, a, an emerging conservative wing within the Republican Party, has basically been unopposed in reaching out to this audience. What has the Democratic Party done? Rather than reminding itself that it used to be the party of the working class, it now embraces more and more the managerial elite, the entrepreneur, the professional, right, the intellectual, the corporatist. This type of third-way Democrat, the, you know, the, the policies of Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, who basically took the disastrous economic policies of Ronald Reagan and just made it a bit more diversified and gay-friendly and a little hipper, right? Did nothing to restore the stability and the strength of the working-class sector of the country that was gutted by Ronald Reagan. So when third-way Democrats like Joe Biden or um, you know, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or Hillary Clinton, any of these people, right, these dime a dozen neolibs are advocating this type of free market fundamentalism, very similar to that of the Republicans, but they're also adding in a cultural element of diversity and inclusion, um, which of course looks down upon traditional values, uh, parochialism, you know, at the absolute best, it just simply ignores. It doesn't invest, right? It just ignores and allows to wither away on the vine. At worst, it attacks as being misogynistic, as being racist. Look, I've been in enough um, conversations with faculty members, tenured faculty members, where I'm making this argument, the Democratic Party has done nothing for years in reaching out to the working class of West Virginia, of Kentucky, of Tennessee, of Kansas. And at some point, someone in that room is going to turn to me and say, yeah, but you know, those coal miners of West Virginia, those farmers of Kansas, you know, they're homophobic. They're like racist. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, and? So what? You know, if I don't care if they're homophobic or guess what? A lot of working class people throughout history had their own, you know, ethnocentric hangups. You know, we didn't really, you know, maybe we should go back in time uh, to the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution or the American socialist labor movements and, you know, go with a clipboard and take some of these striking workers and say, excuse me, sir, do, what do you believe? Should marriage between a man and a woman or whatever they want to have, right? And so, oh my God, they're all racist. We shouldn't support these people. It's like, this is the reason why the Democrats are losing because they play into identity politics rather than play to their strengths. Rather than embrace, let's say, the social democracy of the New Deal, they embrace the woke policies of what I call now the brunch liberals. You know, the latte liberals was, you know, in the 2000s. You know, these are the liberals that are now like, oh, thank God Trump is out of office. I can have my mimosa and go back to brunch and be happy again. It's like, w okay, your little gentrified neighborhood is great. Not like you had any problems. Trump made you money. I hate to break it to these professional managerial class liberals. Trump made you money, right? He increased your stock portfolio. None of these Buttigieg, Warren, um, Klobuchar, Biden supporting woke liberals got poor during four years of Trump, okay? So in that sense, if the Democratic Party continues to go down the road of the John Kerry's, the Kamala Harris's, the um, even the Mike Bloomberg, for God's sake, I mean, I remember the New York Times op-ed page fawn over the idea that Mike Bloomberg is now entered the Democratic race and he can finally put a stop to that 
evil, dastardly, cantankerous, annoyingly grumpy Bernie Sanders because Bernie is just ruining it for everybody, despite the fact that Bernie had a grassroots movement that I will go on record to say, had it not been for Obama interfering and all of a sudden elevating Biden, who was in what, fifth place after Nevada? all of a sudden now gets top billing because he forces Klobuchar, Buttigieg, uh, Harris, and Booker out. Um, and now we got this guy that, you know, f said nothing will fundamentally change. And the liberal media is like, oh my God, Joe Biden is even more progressive than Bernie and FDR put together. And most Americans are like, what Joe Biden are you talking about? It's that kind of rhetoric, that type of fawning over a blue-blooded liberal elite that is going to very likely create a reactionary backlash in the 2022 elections. And if the Republicans take the House and the Senate, these are no longer your Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich Republicans. These are your Ted Cruz, Tom Cotton, Donald Trump Republicans. These, interestingly enough, these actually make good on their cultural promises. As you've noticed in the past couple of months, last year or two, there's been some states that have made abortion all but illegal. They're finally making do on this. And these evangelical conservatives couldn't be happier. And what does the Democratic Party do? Maybe we need to cater more to the Republicans. I hate to break it to you guys, but Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden might as well openly and advocate and openly and unapologetically advocate for hardcore Bolshevism, because that's how they are perceived in cultural conservative media. Don't try to cater to the Republicans. Don't try to think that you can, you know, wither away some of those Reagan Democrats, because in this day and age, those Reagan Democrats are few and far between. And Pelosi, Schumer, Clinton, they're all demonized routinely within this cultural narrative. Okay? So how and why does this work? A third hypothesis is the very successful redesigning of rural America into the American heartland. Okay? Rural America throughout much of the 20th century, the Dust Bowl. You know, states that are square, literally square. Even their counties are square. Right? They, you know, communities that, you know, are largely agricultural, farming, and that's one thing. But when the farms are being shut down, when the small towns are being boarded up, because all the industry is either going to the cities or they're being outsourced. Rural America is now becoming desolate America. It's underpopulated America. What did the cultural conservative narrative do? Take an area that is basically destined to be, for the most part, empty and lifeless, um, and turn it into the symbolic heartland of the country. Right? The glorification of the simple, the plain-spoken American as the soul of the country. Despite the fact that many of these Americans are poor, they're sick, they have, you know, they, they are afraid of going bankrupt if they, you know, have to go to a hospital or see a doctor. Um, but it's the heartland of America now that is populated by these disenfranchised people who should take pride in their simplicity, enjoy their Coors or their Bud, forget your artisanal craft beer, right? Open a can of Keystone Light, which 24 cans to a case costs you six bucks, okay? Um, shop at your Walmart, eat at your McDonald's, go to your Bible study groups, and when you really want to doll yourself up that one weekend every month and take the family out and spend a little money, yeah, go to Applebee's for endless apps, right? That's the heart, that's America, that's our culture, right? And you know what? The fact that we are looked down upon by these coastal elites Great. The more you hate us, the more I love my, you know what, I'll even have my Bible study group in McDonald's next time, just to piss you off, right? Just to piss you off. And speaking of which, another reason why it works, one of those weird things, I don't try to think too much into it, but it works. The psychological importance of simply owning the libs, you know, cutting your nose off to spite your face. You know, burning your house down just to prevent the real estate developer from buying it. You know, I will inconvenience myself. I will get sick. I will vote against my interests. Why? Because it makes you liberal elites cry. You have no idea why we do what we do. And we win elections all the time. 
you have no idea how much this group loved watching video footage of people at Hillary Clinton's electoral um, big party in New York that night, and they're all tearing up. They realize it's over. They realize Trump won, right? And they just, they eat that stuff up. They love that stuff, right? And yes, supporting some policies might be self-wounding. But once again, economics comes and goes, you know? You win some, you lose some, you lose some, you win some more. Culture is all or nothing. And once we lose it, we can't ever get it back. So not only that, the narrative also goes, you know what? We're poor anyway. We don't have a lot to begin with. But you know what? We know how to survive. We know how to make do with what little we have. So what? We're not going to be rich. We're not going to be like Donald Trump. But we know how to cope with problems and hardships. Oh, and at the end of the day, if we do need help, our church group will help us out. Yeah, you know, religion, the thing that you think is so stupid, right? The church group helps us out. The community helps us out. We know everybody by our first name. You people who are living in your, you know, big high-rise apartments in gentrified neighborhoods in New York or Philly or Boston or Atlanta or Chicago or L.A. or San Francisco or Portland or whatever it is, right? You don't know anybody. You're all atomized, Right? You don't know what, you know, if your yoga class is closed for the day, you, 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 you curl up in a ball and cry. You know, we, on the other hand, we know how to take it. So in that sense, sure, I'll take it. I'll, you know, wound myself. I'll inconvenience myself. But if it pisses Rosie O'Donnell off, if it makes the people who watch The View cry, damn it, that is exactly what I'm going to do, <clears throat> right? So there is a sense of fatalism within this cultural conservative narrative as well. And if its adherents are okay with that, that makes it even more sustainable. So at the end of the day then, is it really about culture and not the economy? Stupid? Is it more culture this day and age? Um, yes and no. I mean, if you think about culture as a tool of organization and mobilization against moderates, then yes, then yes it is. Um, and we have to note that it's more than just culture in the sense, but it's activism. It's political activism, right? Especially the activism of the evangelical conservatives of the 1990s, right? We like to think that these people are just basically a bunch of Bible-thumping knuckle-draggers. And I got news for you. Evangelical conservatives are some of the hardest-working, most dedicated people in this country. Their ideas are are nuts, <clears throat> okay? Some of the things that they advocate as far as women and children, I mean, you're right up there with the borderland between Afghanistan and Pakistan, you know? And, you know, mullah and mullah, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, mullah or mullet, you know, whatever. They're pretty much the same thing, right? But you know what? <clears throat> they get what they want. They're determined. So in some way, that same degree of activism which defined Kansas from a century and a century and a half ago, it's still there. It's just being directed towards other goals and policies. Um, probably one of the biggest, um, probably most cathartically symbolic victory was Operation Rescue, which was a major rally, a major anti-abortion rally uh, scheduled, I think sometime in the early 90s, it could have been 91, 92, something like that, in Wichita, Kansas. And, you know, at the time, you think Kansas today, I mean, abortion is pretty much illegal. There was actually an abortion clinic in Wichita that actually did late-term abortion, right? So, like, this is, you know, the equivalent of, like, full-blown fetus killers. Um, and there was this, you know, organized note, you know, there was a you know, well-known in advance that there was going to be a, one of these big anti-abortion rallies in Wichita. The Wichita police actually convinced the abortion clinics, the Planned Parenthoods, and other, you know, liberal to moderate right shops to close for the day, right? They, they did it out of safety. That was actually the biggest problem because, it's, and they closed for the week. So before the rally even happened, right, the Operation Rescue Leadership th thought that this was the biggest victory out there because we got the abortion clinics to close, not indefinitely, but we got them to close, while we were rallying. It shows that they were scared. This created a major groundswell of support. They had no idea that they would be this fortunate. 
And of course, you bust people in from other states to inflate the numbers. You hold a big rally in the you know football stadium. Pat Buchanan gives a speech. I mean, this is really the beginning of the new culture wars within the United States, which I think culminated in the 1992 um, um, presidential uh, Republican primary when um, when when um, when Pat Buchanan uh, gave this you know hellfire and brimstone speech about saving America uh, from the hedonism of liberalism. So you know, is it about culture? Yeah, it does, but culture harnessed with active and dedicated political purpose. I say once again, you think America is dumb? Uh uh, America is a hell of a lot smarter than you give them credit to be. Okay. The second thing is that these narratives, they're absolutist, they are uncompromising, they are not interested at all in moderation. And this has now become effectively the mantra of the Republican Party, right? The Republican Party says to the Democrats, you want to compromise with us? Sure, you compromise your values to meet ours. We're not meeting you at all. Okay? And when the narrative will meet the expected opposition, of ridicule and condemnation, um, they're ready for it, right? They're absolutely ready for it. In fact, that might even help explain why some of these narratives reach the level of absurdism as it does, right? We're, we're talking about, you know, the opposition to the ridiculousness, the hyperbolic sense of, you know, faith, family, and freedom, um, you know, rather than, let's say, you know, engaging in factual truth, you know what it does? It just simply entrenches beliefs and it assures conviction. You know, it's just simply a way of keeping everybody organized for or against. And when the against comes, when the predicted condemnation comes from Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, Michael Moore, MSNBC, um, you know, CNN, Hollywood, Sean Penn, Alyssa Milano, who, you know, whoever they're in the Oprah Winfrey, whoever these, you know, people are, they're waiting, they expect it to happen. They love it because it just increases their conviction even further. Another reason why is it all about culture, as I've said before, but it's, it needs to be emphasized again. These messages are largely hegemonic because they run virtually uncontested, right? Uncontested. You know, how, how prominent is the Democratic Party in Kansas, in Oklahoma, in Idaho, um, in um, West Virginia, in Tennessee, in Mississippi? I mean, I'm sure that there's a Democratic Party headquarters there. Um, I'm pretty certain that they have all but given up uh, reaching out to anybody outside of, you know, like the major, you know, urban cities, you know, or if it's in the South, maybe the black population, that's about it. Um, but to this overwhelmingly large, rural, lower class, white community, this narrative, the Republican narrative, the great uh, backlash runs uncontested, okay, uncontested. So one can say whatever they want. And they can frame it if they really want to in, you know, cultural cleavages, class warfare. I mean, yes, it's cultural cleavages, you know, traditional versus elitist. But it's also, you know what, you're poor, but you're traditional, you're simple versus the rich, the decadent, right? The rich and the decadent, they get moderate, you know? They start hanging out with Democrats. They start thinking that abortions should be tolerated. No, 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 no. You're poor, you're white, you're reactionary. That's hardcore traditional Americanism, right? And look, as long as the counter narratives avoid presenting anything that is socioeconomic and continue with the identity driven, the great backlash is designed to withstand this, right? That's why prior to Bernie Sanders, much of the Democratic Party was power. They had no idea what to do with these groups. I mean, you know, it's only when, and again, I don't want to put too much emphasis on Sanders, but when Sanders decides to go to West Virginia, you know, a bastion of Republican solidarity, and talk directly to the coal miners who are legitimately fearful for their future. Now, he, he, this is a great example of this, right? Let's not talk about what's the matter with Kansas. Let's talk about what's the matter with West Virginia. 
The coal miners know that this is an endangered job, right? It's considered to be dirty, environmentally unhealthy. You know, they're wondering, are they going to have a job next year? They're going to have a job next month. As far as the Democratic Party is concerned, you know, it's Hillary Clinton's soundbite of, you know, oh, we're going to put a lot of coal miners out of work when I'm in office. It's like, lady, what the hell are you talking about? This is the reason why they vote Republican. The Republican Party, I don't know if they really care about environmentalism or not, but they're subsidized by the fossil fuel industry, and that gives them absolute, you know, control over the coal mining vote, who are going to vote Republican because their votes, their jobs will be saved. When Sanders goes to West Virginia and talks about green energy and talks about the need to transition away from coal, but develop areas of coal country of West Virginia into the new centers of renewable energy and training the coal miners away from this towards the skilled labor of wind and solar energy, whatever it is, he's telling the workers, your jobs are secure. He's telling them, I understand why you're voting Republican because the Democrats have completely abandoned you because they all think that you're white, you're rural, you must be anti-gay, therefore you're not part of our rainbow coalition, whatever the you know, hell they're talking about, right? Sanders basically says, you know what, let's go back to good old-fashioned uh, class consciousness and let's talk about making West Virginia one of the main places for manufacturing, producing, and using renewable energy. And all of a sudden, not a surprise, Sanders wins West Virginia primary, hands down. He wins most of rural America, hands down. He won Michigan in 2016. He got Wisconsin. He got Minnesota. He got California. All right. He got all these places where working class people would vote Democrat, would vote Sanders if he was on the ticket. But instead, we get some innocuous identity politic driven neolib that wants to keep things the way that they are. Things that gave us Donald Trump anyway, so, you know, we're right back to where we were, right? So as long as the Democratic Party continues to operate in, you know, yes, we need more female and people of color imperialists, then the Republicans are going to continue to lock in the traditional lower class, white working class vote. So yes, it is about culture, stupid. It is about culture, but insofar it's all about culture, as most political actors do not contest neoliberalism and private enterprise. So, you know, you know Frank wrote a, a follow-up book to What's the Matter with Kansas called Listen Up, Liberal, which, you know, at the, the afterword of his book, at least the paperback, you know, sort of talks about the problems, the cultural fallout, you know, afterward, culture war Armageddon, in which he rightfully points out in 0405, that the Democratic Party risks becoming increasingly irrelevant if they continue to push only identity politics and urban-driven diversity. You lose the working class vote. You lose the argument on socioeconomics because there's no counter-argument to that. The Republicans have, gotten, have got these votes by playing the culture card. What we find is otherwise working class left-wing voting constituents. If there is no social democratic, progressive, left-wing class-based, working class oriented party in a two-party system, whatever, they will default to the right. Why? National populism. National populism seeks to preserve jobs away from the immigrants. You know, classic populism, how do we preserve your jobs? By keeping the factories here and, you know, disempowering the elites. How do national populists do this? Build a wall, keep out the Mexicans. Either way, it's a way of saying, vote for me, I'll preserve your job. Vote for me, I'll preserve your way of life. In the absence of a left-wing movement like Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn or Podemos or, you know, groups like that, right? Groups will default to the right. Why? Because the right has tapped into that grievance. But they've done so in a way by changing the discourse away from economics towards culture. If the Democratic Party continues to play the neoliberal third-way card, Republicans will continue to win elections in Kansas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Kentucky, you name it, okay? And we will still be wondering, what is the matter with Kansas? And the answer will be, folks, there is absolutely nothing wrong with Kansas. What's the matter with you? 
How come you haven't figured this out by now? 30 years and you're still pushing this neoliberal Bill Clinton, Barack Obama thing by foisting Biden on us. He's not going to do anything, as you've already seen. 15 buck a minimum wage, that's out the toilet, right? How about um, student debt relief? Wow, $1 billion. That's couch cushion money. You know how much we're talking about as far as the student debt bubble? Um, you know, so all of these things, which could happen with the Democratic Party, doesn't. So it's not just that the Republicans have outsmarted everyone. It's that the Republicans are simply running unopposed, right? And, you know, until we get more left-wing progressives in the debate, a lot of these Republican states will remain Republican, right? They will not change one bit at all. So again, what's the matter with Kansas? Well, what's the matter with American politics over the last 30 years? All right, I think that we've covered enough. This really um, you know, takes care of a large chunk of the book. And uh, you know, we had a lot to discuss. I know I kind of got a little um, talk show myself here by the end of this lecture, but I promised, I promised, I hoped uh, I would be uh, at least interesting and entertaining. So anyway, um, I look forward for those of you that are enrolled in my class to a fruitful discussion as always. Uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, feel free to leave your comments in the comment section. Anyone is welcome around the world. Um, next week, next week we are continuing uh, with our discussion of white political culture and why they do the things that they do uh, by looking at Jonathan Metzl's book, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. Um, so it's just one more depressing thing after another, but that's American political culture for you. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's all for this week. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. Um, have a great, great end of the week, um, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Take care, everyone.